Dr. Lockwood, I believe we've got a few more people that may be trying to get on, so we may give them just a minute or two more before you start, but um, I'm going to go ahead and launch um, our first little poll so that we can kind of see what people are growing. Okay, sounds good. Looks like we have everybody uh, that could see the poll has posted in it. Dr. Lockwood, it looks like you've got quite a few that have apples and peaches, uh, some that have grapes and blueberries. And I'm going to share those results so that you can, you can see. Yeah, I was kind of surprised that I didn't see any other fruit trees because I thought we might have some people that might have maybe some of the nectarines or the apricots or yeah. some of those fruits, but I didn't see any. Yeah. yeah. Well, in line of what we talked about, we'd say the peaches will apply to nectarines and, and uh, plums and so on. So we'll be covering some of those and see if they have some. All right, it looks like it is about three minutes after, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the presentation with Dr. Lockwood. We have uh, Dr. Lockwood with us, and he is our fruit specialist, and today he's going to talk with us on apples and peaches and pruning and spraying and fertilization of those. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Lockwood. All right, well, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing up and learn it without messing it up. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and I, I also put in some uh, information on some of the more common nut trees, too, because don't mention those very often. Uh, I would invite questions at any point during this because uh, it's a fairly broad topic and, and uh, I'm probably not going to be hitting the points that y'all have some interest in this far if you don't stop me and, and kind of push me in the right direction. So what we'll do is start off a little bit on some general information on fruit. Uh, one of the things that we run into is uh, fruit crop production tends to be a high risk venture. Uh, high risk and you know, high inputs in both labor management and capital, relatively little mechanization, several years before return on the investment, and then, of course, the stability of the crop. So, right, there are a lot of negatives there, but there are also some positives, and fruit uh, production can be done on a relatively small acreage, and it can utilize a lot of property that's not desirable or not feasible for traditional 
row crop agriculture. So uh, really sunshine land that, that's closer to the point that uh, you really don't want to put other crops on the other than say pasture uh, can be utilized in many cases for fruit. And also with fruit compared to other crops, uh, we've got a, a potentially high return per acre. So there are some uh, negatives definitely, but there are some strong positives food crop production. So we've, you've all heard this or probably before, but when we talk about growing a food crop, uh, one of the things we really push is site selection because it's going to impact everything that happens to that crop. And, and undoubtedly, it's the most important decision you can make in the life of the crop. So um, that's something that you don't want to uh, cut corners on. Uh, when I go out and look at a, a site, if somebody's wanting to grow a fruit crop, uh, I, I try to have a mental score sheet in mind so I can rank the site. And these are some of the points that I look at. <coughs> of course, for marketing, regardless of whether you're going to market on the farm or you're going to put the crop somewhere else, uh, the location, the accessibility of that crop is important. Can your customer base get to you easily? or can you get to your market easily? How much time do you have to spend off the farm if you're taking uh, stuff to a, a market or to a utilization point? Those are things are all important because uh, in many cases, the, the grower is also the marketer and therefore they're being pulled in a lot of different directions and, uh, so they don't need to be gone a lot. Individual uh, uh, sites, uh, the characteristics that I look at beyond accessibility. Number one is elevation. Relative elevation is what is means how high is that area in regards to the immediate surroundings. And we look at that as a, a natural frost protection and a radiation frost event, and also some disease protection. You know, with radiation frost, frost settles in the low areas first. And depending on the severity of the frost, uh, you may have an elevated site that will be free of the frost. So uh, we, we try to take care of the passive controls uh, for that. And of course, from a disease standpoint, an elevated site is, is apt to be up out of the pond area where uh, in the, the less time that the leaves and fruits are wet, the less potential you have for disease. So that can have an impact. Directing the slope, uh, it's kind of a now we're starting to refine our site somewhat, but it is important. Uh, my there are differences, and, and some people will argue that directing the slope is not that big a deal, but uh, be aware of the differences. Generally, a, a crop that's on the south facing slope is more prone to winter entry because it, uh, the uh, sun hits it better and, and uh you're apt to see things like southwest trunk damage becoming more of an impact. Uh, they also, because that south slope is real warmer, is the crop's going to break dormancy and become active earlier, and will therefore be a little bit more uh, in jeopardy of the late frost. If you go on a north facing slope, you, you've got a, a little bit of natural protection from that type of cold damage. And we also find and then on the south facing slope, the soils tend to be thinner, uh, they tend to be drier, they're lower in organic matter. And so be aware that that is a difference and, and it can uh, necessitate a little bit more aggressive use of things like irrigation depending on the crop you're growing. Uh, if I had to pick my favorite slope direction, it's going to be northeast. I want a combination of what the north the slope offers as far as natural protection, but I also want that morning sun that a new space the slope will give you. Next thing we look at is how steep the slope can uh, do you have. You know, the plants don't care. Uh, I was uh, in some vineyards in, in southern France several years ago that um, it was sort of like being on the top deck of, of Vineyard Stadium. You know, you, I when I'm up there, I feel like, okay, I'm going to trip and fall, and if you do, you end up on the field. You're going all the way to the bottom. Well, that was the way these vineyards were. Everything that was done, uh, Peter Vineyard was done using a backpack sprayer or a hamper on your back to spray the fruit off the slope. 
Uh, to me, that's pretty pretty rugged. That's not the way I would want to farm. So we want to have a slope that is um, going to be safe enough for you or whoever works with you to be out there running equipment, oftentimes in relatively poor weather conditions. You know, we, we have to spray a lot in the spring of the year. A lot of times when the, the soils are wet, uh, in fact, you may be spraying in the rain depending on the situation. And you don't want to be on a slope where you, you don't feel comfortable uh, out there with the equipment. Look at the soil characteristics. We'd like to have a soil that's well drained, both internally and surface drained. I'd like to see 30, 36 inches of rooting depth. The greater the area the root system can occupy, the better off the plant's going to be. Now, in most of our crops, you're going to find the bulk of the cedar roots in the upper 12, 18 inches of soil. But it's surprising how deep some of these crops have put down roots. So uh, I, you don't want to jeopardize the, the uh, growth and survival of the crop on, on soils that are going to be too thin. And if you do have to go on a western, say, 30 inch depth, realize that that can be an issue. Uh, the plants aren't necessarily going to grow as much. You could change spacing, but you also need to, to uh, manage that soil a little bit differently. Uh, I look at water. Uh, irrigation has become more and more of an issue. Uh, if you grow apples and you go to a full growth high density, you need to integrate a, an irrigation system into those plants. And so the quantity of water, the quality of water is going to be looked at uh, as well. Wildlife, uh, you know, more and more we're seeing wildlife problems. And so you want to be aware of that potential. And when you make your, your budget, at least uh, set aside some money that would uh, it could be used if you had to institute some wildlife practices like fencing or netting or whatever. Then be aware of what's going on next door, uh, especially if you're looking at any organic production. You know, there uh, we've got uh, buffer zones for, for many of these crops, and that zone will, will vary. Uh, but also, even in traditional uh, agriculture, we, we have to be aware of what's happening next door. We will we'll have issues with uh, drift or herbicides or whatever. And you want to be aware of, of those things so that you can at least uh, take minimal uh, practices to, to avoid problems. <coughs> We've already uh, talked a little bit about this, so I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, this is the calendar that I show a lot for taking care of fruit crops. In there are several things that um, we do throughout the, the calendar year that are very important. So now we're still in, the, in what I consider to be a good planting time for bare root crops, uh, generally mid-February through the month of March. I like to have the plants in the ground before we get very far into April, because if it turns out dry and warm, um, those root plants are going to struggle. So planting this time of year, Pruning is something that's still going on. Uh, normally say wait as late as you can to prune and still get it all done. We change the way we talk about pruning and the timing depending on the crop. Uh, a lot of peach growers are actually finishing up their pruning after bloom. So they can compensate for frost damage by the way they prune the tree. Grape growers are, are doing some variety after bud swell starts, after the vines are no longer dormant because uh, we can lessen the incidence of certain cancer diseases by pruning after the vine is, is active. Uh, the wound will close up quicker. And so those canker uh, diseases that infect a tree or a vine through the pruning crop uh, have less opportunity to do so. so I have put thinning on here. You know, it's, uh, the fruit buds on, on most of our fruit crops are formed during the summer of the year before the fruit actually shows up. And on a healthy uh, fruit tree, apple, pear, peach, you can set up what we consider to be a full crop on a relatively small percentage of the fruit bud. So we have, we leave more fruit buds on the plant because you can always take stuff off later on if you don't have a frost to freeze. 
But if you have a fossil freeze, you can't put those fruit guards back on. So we leave perhaps more fruit around the tree than uh, the tree really needs. But if we get by without any fossil freeze damage to limit the crop, then we have to come back in and adjust properly back then. Because pest control goes on year round, depending on what we're going after. Harvest, uh, we're expanding our harvest window all the time with new varieties and the tendency is to go later. Uh, we're picking apples now in November with varieties like Pink Lady and, and Gold Rush. Uh, so that's a, a window that uh, uh, is constantly changing. Uh, we're looking at sanitation. It's a very important thing uh, in, in whatever crop you're growing. So for years, we've talked about uh, apples after we finish harvest and as we approach natural leaf drop, spraying the orchard with the urea, spray, spray the tree, spray the ground under the tree to help the leaf litter and mummified fruit to decompose more quickly over winter. And because the, several of our diseases and some insects over winter on the orchard floor, if we can get rid of that leaf litter, in that mummified fruit, we can decrease the amount of inoculum that we go into the growing season with on certain diseases. One thing that's not here uh, that I've run into is uh, ordering new uh, plant stock. We are seeing a real heavy demand for trees and vines and bushes uh, for fruit crops this year. And, and uh, I've been told by several plant sources that they don't have any more stock, they're sold out for the year. Uh, if you want a variety that's in demand and a root stock that's in demand, then you need to order early. Uh, in, in some cases, you might order late summer or fall for spring delivery of, of the plant. In other cases, we're actually having to order two or three years ahead. But that's the point that, that needs to be factored into a successful orchard. Um, I might also say that uh, you want to go through the best possible nursery you can go to to get that plant. Uh, the cost of the tree, the cost of the vine is, is relatively insignificant when you compare it to the investment you have once it's in the ground. So we'll move on. Uh, pollination is something we look at. Uh, most of our fruit crops are insect pollinators. So if you've got a showy bloom like you see in peach or apple, or strawberry, blackberry, whatever, those are insect pollinators. And, and so we want to make sure that our management program takes that into account. Not using the insecticide during bloom, or if you have to spray an insecticide, do it late in the day so that you're not as apt to, to damage some of the pollinating insects. Uh, if you've got a, a non showy bloom like we see in nut trees and grapevines, then the wind is the primary pollinator and uh, not insects. But uh, while we've got talking about insect pollination, I might point out that uh, one of the things that I like to see is no plants that bloom in the orchard. You know, we, we have issues that. Uh, if you've got dandelions, if you've got clover, uh, you've also got problems with insects in the orchard at times that you have to be using insecticidal spray. And so the best orchard floor cover is, is a grass, is a stock, not a broadleaf weed. And broadleaf weeds also are more apt to be open and host to uh, insects and disease problems that can affect the crop itself. So we'll focus a little bit on apple and then we'll move into some of the other crops. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the development of the crop. And apples, more than any other fruit crop, is going through a lot of changes. We've, we've gone from the standard trees to semi dwarf and now we're, we're going pretty strong in the full dwarf high density apple plantings, and, and the whole picture is changing. So with Apples, if you have a dwarf tree, we can get into production really quickly now with some of these dwarf root stocks. Uh, one year after planting on some of these combinations, we can have fruit on the tree. It's uh, depending on how trees grow, you may uh, 
playing on a couple of years, but uh, it's not at all uncommon with some of them to have, to have to, in that first year. Uh, it'll take a little bit longer, a couple, three more years to get the full production. So it's a quick return. Now, with a full dwarf orchard, we're putting out a lot of seeds per acre. You know, uh, used to be with the standard trees, uh, standard size trees, tree populations used to be anywhere from about 27 up to about 40 trees per acre. We went up in the semi dwarfs and upped our tree population to uh, around 100 to 120, on up to close to 300 trees per acre. And now we're looking at uh, anywhere from 600 to 800 or more trees per acre. And uh, the trend in the southeast is uh, more and more trees per acre. We're, we lag behind what's happening in the more uh, northern map areas, but we've seen our track follow theirs. And uh, I don't know what will happen if we'll get to the same extent, but I know orchards up in New York where I was raised now are putting out trees that are about a foot apart in the row, and they're going upwards of, of 1,500, 2,000 trees per acre. Uh, so things have changed a lot. It's a high investment operation. Uh, you know, if you put out a dwarf orchard, you've got a lot of trees, and those trees may average anywhere from eight and a half to ten dollars a tree, depending on variety and wood stock. You've got to build some kind of support system for the trees, and uh, you need irrigation. You may end up well end up with you know, in excess of twenty twenty five thousand dollars an acre uh, just to put on a high density apple plant. So. One of the things that we're seeing more of, and, and uh, it's a good thing, is uh, resistant varieties. And, and I've pushed this for the homeowners a lot, but it's something that the commercial grower needs to take in mind, uh, keep in mind as well. If you've got apple varieties or other fruit varieties that are resistant to some of the more problematic insects or diseases, and the fruit quality and characteristics are what you want, give them serious consideration. And on this chart, for example, uh, Liberty, which is midway down, is uh, one of my favorite apples. It's, it's uh, more disease resistant than any other apple variety that we have. And it's also one of the higher quality apples for its, its time frame. Ripen somewhere around the first part of September for us in Tennessee. But, uh, you know, we're seeing new stuff come down the road all the time. And, and, uh, so it's important to keep in mind um, the, uh, the variety picture and in the expansion, maybe look at some of these uh, varieties that are going to be a little bit easier to grow. Unfortunately, many of the real popular apples that, that we have right now are some of the, are among the more difficult apples to grow. And I, I direct that primarily towards honey tips. Uh, I am not a fan of honey uh, I, The customers like it. The customers demand it. It is one of the worst apples to grow of any of them that we have. So uh, honey is uh, seriously susceptible to bitter pit, which is calcium deficiency. And it actually has to do with, with a cellular difference in the plant and the allocation of, of uh, or partitioning of calcium within the plant. A lower percentage of calcium in honeycomb goes to the fruit than in other varieties, and therefore benefit becomes more of a problem. It's also because of the uh, partly because of that cellular difference that honeycomb is one of the worst for a disease called bitter rot. And quite often, 40, 60 percent or more of that crop is lost before we ever get to harvest. So we need to be aware of some of the strengths and weaknesses of these varieties. And uh, try to um, select those that will fit in best with our ability to hold. Um, we're going to move through this fairly quickly, but anyhow, as we already said, we're, we're getting fruit into production a lot quicker than what we used to. Uh, and, and that's a good thing because it's just an investment and the payback is, is uh, critical that we start getting early returns. So we've gone from standard to semi dwarf, and semi dwarf trees are still a viable option for some growers. And one of the things that I try to do when I work with the growers to assess their 
ability to handle uh, some of the more intense management practices. But there are some good semi dwarf root stocks out there, and depending on the way you want to mark the crop, depending on the familiarity of growing apples, it may well be that semi dwarf right now is still the way you ought to go. However, as you get more aware of, of the uh, production needs in these uh, fruits, I would encourage the, the growers to send more fruit to higher density. It's, uh, they're going to be better off. They're going to pay off the investment much quicker. But the, uh, this just shows the trends we see. In, and this is where we, we're going now with high density. So we got a tree wall. Uh, when you grow these things, the philosophy of growing the tree has to change a lot from what we used in our, our standard semi dwarf tree. We do very little pruning in a dwarf orchard, uh, whereas in the other pruning is a major part of our work. But in a you know, full dwarf tree, pruning is going to step back the ability of that tree to cut that early crop. It's going to cost you a lot of money. And so rather than prune, we tend to manipulate the trees. So we're selecting uh, limbs, tying limbs down, tying limbs up, pulling them uh, out of the uh, row so they don't grow directly out into the drive row. We try to keep a narrow row for good light penetration and make it more accessible. Uh, the trend that we're seeing in other areas, and we don't have it in Tennessee yet, but uh, we're going through these high density orchards, making a tree wall that may be upwards of 10 to 12 feet in height. And the growers are now getting platforms to, to run through the orchard to do things like uh, pruning, thinning, and harvest. So they'll have a platform uh, that may have uh, two or three height stages. You know, one person will work off the ground. The self propelled platform may have. Uh, two or three people at different heights picking a certain portion of the tree and, and uh, continuously moving through the orchard. I mean, the, the mechanization is coming into apples a lot uh, more than what it used to be. Advantages of dwarf trees, we've already talked a little bit about that, but getting into bearing early so you can start to get a return on your investment, higher and more consistent fruit quality. And the reason for that, of course, is you got a smaller tree canopy, light penetration, air movement, and spray penetration is a lot better on that small open tree. It costs less actually to, to grow in certain aspects of our full growth. We use about half the pesticide in a high density orchard that we use in, in a medium to low density. Our yields may be higher, although that's not a major. Uh, some point on, on high density, but our uh, quality is definitely higher and more consistent. And that, that is something that we really look at. The disadvantage of, of dwarf trees is that you've got a tree that's poorly anchored. It has to have support. It also has to have irrigation. Costs a lot to get into uh, production with it. And the manager has to be more capable than they do for a lower density. Planning. One of the things that uh, to keep in mind too is that uh, I talked about the need for irrigation. As we go into these high density orchards, uh, we've got uh, a reduced root system on the tree, but with the tree populations that we're using, that is the trees close together, uh, we're actually putting a lot more feeder roots in a running foot of row than we have with the other systems. So you can run into problems both in water, lack of water, and lack of adequate nutrition for the trees much more quickly in the dwarf orchard than you can for the, the lower density orchard. So it's important to monitor these things and to stay on top of the, uh, the needs of these, these trees a lot closer. Three, Dr. Lockwood, let me just interrupt you real quick. Um, when you were given varieties uh, earlier, uh, we had a, a question in the chat and they were wanting to know if there was a good place to find some of these varieties because they had never seen those varieties available. Yeah, there, there are uh, 
And most of the nurses will handle some of the diseases, just a variety. Uh, some of them have a whole lot more than others. But you can go to uh, say the uh, Summons Nursing in Ithaca, New York, is one that has a good many of the uh, diseases, just a variety. Uh, Adams County Nursing in Pennsylvania, some of the big name nurseries out of the West Coast, CNO or Van Well, they have them. It's going to be hard to find in some of the uh, smaller nurseries. And if you buy uh, like applicants from, from a Tennessee nursery, it's going to be very difficult to find some of these. They, they don't have the, enough demand to, to uh, carry that big of, of a variety picture. And they may not have some of these more disease resistant varieties in their inventory. So you have to look a little bit more. We can help on that. You know, people start looking and they have difficulty uh, finding them. It's, we'd be glad to try to give them a hand on, on locating some of those. But they're out there. It's just a matter of uh, uh, right now, uh, the demand is for some of the varieties that like the honey, uh, honey crisp and, and uh, pink lady and so on that do not have the disease resistance characteristics we'd like. And the uh, most of the uh, uh, disease resistant varieties are still trying to build their reputation. So I think they'll be more accessible in the coming years than they are right now. This slide shows three rows of apple trees, and they're all the same variety. That Vestar is the name of it. Uh, and they're all the same age trees. But if you'll notice, the uh, far uh, left side where we say D9, uh, that, that tree is quite small when you compare it to the middle row, which is more than 26, and then the uh, outside or far right row is more than seven. So that, it's all the rootstock effect. B9 or Budagoski 9 is a Russian root stock. And it's one of the more dwarfing root stocks that we use. It's equivalent to Marlin 9. Uh, it's a full dwarf tree that uh, will come into bearing very early and give you a, a pretty good returns on fruit quality. The middle row, Marlin 26, is uh, the largest of the full dwarfing root stocks that we have out there. And when we talk about dwarf trees, Right now, with the Geneva series coming in and some of the others, we've actually got somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15 different dwarfing rootstocks for apples that we're working with. Uh, some are much better than others, and some have special uh, uh, assets that we want to take care of. Uh, one of the big weaknesses, for example, in Marlin 26 is that that rootstock is very susceptible to fire growth. So it's a good rootstock, but uh, there are some options, especially out of the Cornell program, uh, for equivalent size trees that uh, in which the rootstock have fire blight resistance. And that's the way we're actually trying to go. We're assessing those rootstocks. We're part of our NC 140 uh, regional apple rootstock program where we're looking at these different rootstock characteristics. And all those Bill is a regional project that's actually international. Uh, and we're, we're getting some good ideas on some of the newer rootstocks to replace some of the old ones like M26. But what this does is shows the different size trees that primarily is a rootstock effect. Um, the Marlin 7 on the far right side is the smallest of the Marlin series semi dwarf stock. And uh, it's not as precocious as the others, but yet it's still a size tree that, that we see quite a bit being planted. Um, this slide shows two trees that are same age and the same variety, but the rootstocks again are different. The tree closest to you is one of the full dwarfing uh, rootstocks like Bud 9, uh, whereas the tree behind it would be something like an M26 or an M7. And the difference in the vigor is only part of the difference. Notice how many apples are on this little tree uh, in front versus how many you see on the tree behind it. The precocity of these full dwarf trees is, is quite amazing. Uh, several
several years ago, I put out a study with a, a grower in Bledsoe County on M27 apple root stock. And M27 is considered to be a stupid oil. It's actually, in many cases, too small for commercial orchards. But uh, the second year the trees were in the ground, we averaged about 30 apples per tree. The third year, 60 apples per tree. And the fourth year, and every year thereafter, it was over 100. Uh, and the size of the uh, apples were pretty good to the point that it was taking less than 100 apples to give you a birthday. So if you've got 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 trees per acre, and you're getting a bushel of apples per tree, you're getting pretty good yield um, off of that acre of ground. So uh, the difference of the root stock can make is really amazing. But again, size control is just part of it. <clears throat> We're looking at uh, fire light resistance, phytosphere resistance, woolly appellation resistance. Uh, all of those are, are important. And more and more, we're also looking at uh, replant tolerance because if you've got a, a farm and you've got X number of acres, you know you're going to recycle your orchards over time. And traditionally, what we've found is if you plant apples back in the site where apples had been growing before, those trees are not going to do as well. We have a replant problem. We have it on peaches after peach, pear after pear. It, it exists for all of us earth, but it's not possible or at least not very easy to find new land uh, in your area for new planters. And therefore, some of these new apple root stocks coming out now that have replant tolerance is, is, is something we're really interested in. You can go back into the same site and not have the restriction on tree survival and growth that we had before. So a lot of different effects can be attributed to the root stock. Now it's important to know that some of them, uh, uh, some of these characteristics are not translated to the variety that's on them. Therefore, uh, one instance of that is fire blight. Uh, just because you have a fire blight resistant root stock does not mean that the variety that's grafted onto that root stock is any less fire blight susceptible than it would be on a different root stock. What it does mean is that we do not have to get a fire blight strike on a root stock because it'll go in and kill the whole root system out of the tree. Okay, so I'm uh, talking a little bit about uh, apples harvest. We've got varieties that are coming in anywhere from up in July and go all the way to November. As a rule, the later an apple ripens, the better quality it is. But, um, the better it stores, it's more generally more apt to be a good processing apple, it's more crunchy. And you know, when I started in Tennessee a long time ago, uh, Red Delicious is by far the dominant apple variety grown over a good bit of the United States and definitely in Tennessee. Probably 80 to uh, 75 to 80 percent or more of our apple acres is Red Delicious. Uh, people like the red color, and they, they uh, associated red color with a good quality apple. They were wrong. Uh, red Delicious is not that good an eating apple, at least in most people's ideas. But what we see now is that the taste in apples has switched. Instead of color, and color is still an important aspect, but the number one attitude, attribute that people look for in apples is crunchiness. And so as we go to some of these later varieties, we're getting into the fruit characteristics that people like more, that crunchy apple. Uh, so we're seeing, and, and later harvested apples were in later maturity varieties store better than the earlier ones. So as we go along, we're, we're seeing more uh, of these great varieties. But from uh, the optimum storage conditions for apples, you know, you can hold apples for a good while under the right conditions. And uh, we, we uh, if we're going to hold them for a while, if we're gonna, the longer we store an apple, the less ripe we want it to be when we take it. Now, there's, it's important to realize that maturity and ripeness in, in apples are two different things. Maturity means that the apple is capable of ripening after it's taken off the tree. It doesn't necessarily mean it's ripe. Ripe 
generally is the sin. Eating or whatever use you're going to make of that fruit, life is when it's ready for that use. So eating like this is going to be a lot different than just the third. Uh, but if you're going to hold an apple for a longer period of time, you pick it less ripe than you would if you're going to sell it for, uh, immediately for fresh consumption. So with our storages, um, we ideally we'd like to store apples down to about freezing. Some varieties actually store better at about 31 degrees Fahrenheit, others about 33, and high humidity, greater than 90%. So we don't lose moisture in the storages, and we want to have good air circulation. Uh, the reason apples will ripen off the tree after they mature is that they're, uh, they have what we call a climactic, that is they generate ethylene gas. Ethylene is a natural ripening hormone that will stimulate increased ripening. And if you have a, a storage room that does not have good air circulation and you put in a bunch of apples, you'll end up with pockets in that storage where you get a buildup of ethylene and the apples will ripen faster there than they will in other parts of storage. So you may end up pulling out apples that are actually over a tree. So you want good air circulation in that storage. How long you can store a variety depends on, uh, like I said, the stage of ripeness and the variety. Uh, we don't have any control of atmosphere storage in Tennessee, but with the CA storage, we put the apples in. Uh, we uh, pull the oxygen levels down and raise the CO2 uh, levels and actually put the apples to sleep or slow down respiration. And you can store them for a year or longer and still have uh, an acceptable apple. The, to me, uh, they're not as good as, as the, uh, uh, a newer uh, apple, one that's not been stored as long, but still it's possible to store for a long period of time. When the right conditions are used. This is a uh, show some of the more common apple diseases that we encounter. Uh, apple scab is number one apple disease worldwide, but seems interesting enough, it's not that big a problem in most parts of Tennessee. Uh, if you look at uh, Tennessee's conditions, a lot of times apple scab has actually a primary and secondary infection period. The primary infection period occurs before bloom. Uh, when you get uh, green tissue uh, showing up and those leaves are starting to unfold, and you get a rainy period, especially if the temperatures are elevated, you can have a scab infection period in just a few hours. After the infection occurs, uh, that then we're, we become prone to a secondary infection after a while, and that usually comes after the fruit has started to develop. In Tennessee, a good bit of Tennessee in, in the southeast, the temperatures get too warm too fast for secondary scab infection to occur. So I don't see it much. Uh, a lot of the varieties the disease resistance are, are built on scab immunity, uh, which is good, but I wish that they had addressed summer rocks more because the summer rocks are bigger problems for us. We move down the list on the left hand side, uh, bitter rot is the next apple coming down. And bitter rot is the number one apple disease you see in the south. It's a summer rot, although uh, it, infection can actually start very early in the season, right after the apple starts to form. But you can get renewed infections all the way through the summer, up into harvest, and even after harvest. Uh, it's a hard disease to control. And uh, it, it takes as little as five hours of leaf wetness to get an infection period. So if you have, uh, in midsummer, you have a late evening shower, you will have that infection period by the time the sun comes off the next morning. So it's a hard one to control. Uh, the control pattern, uh, the control methods are pretty much, uh, well, preventive. We're going to start off. Uh, with good orchard sanitation, getting rid of the mummified fruit, and, and then we're going to start our spray program very early, uh, actually before bloom, uh, to control this. 
the best materials for it, unfortunately, are, are some of the EDDC fungicides. And uh, by the time uh, we really need them, we can't use them anymore. Uh, Man's aid or diapine has a 77 day pre harvest interval. So shortly after that first or second cover spray, after uh, bloom, we have to stop using that product. We, we fall back on the uh, things like Captain, uh, Captain plus Toxinam, or Xyran, or Prophyte uh, to help. But it's a difficult disease to control. Um, this bit of rod is kind of an interesting one because there are no leaf symptoms of the disease, uh, or at least we didn't think there were. It was one that showed up entirely in the apple. And there's a disease called white rock, the one you see at the bottom on the left, that from the outside of the apple looking at it looks identical. The only way, or the easiest way to tell apart uh, white rock from bitter rot is to cut the apple open. And you can see the cross section of the apple uh, on the left hand side, the, the conical development of that rot as it progresses from the outside of the apple into the core uh, is typical of bitter rot. If it was white rot, it would be more of a cylindrical uh, pattern of that disease moving in where the uh, rotted area down near the core may be about as wide as it is on, on the skin. But on bitter rot, it's a funnel shape or conical pattern. Moving on down, uh, the next disease is black rot. Black rot shows up on the leaves as frog eye leaf spot. And that's what we see here. And it comes in quite early. It also shows up on the fruit. And instead of giving us a soft rot, as we see with bitter rot, the apples will tend to shrivel up and they'll be fairly hard and leathery and not a juicy rot. Uh, black rot fruit will mummify and hang on the tree and will be there the next growing season if you don't remove it. And therefore, it's a, a real threat to you. Um, the black eye leaf spot can be a problem in that it's going to hurt the photosynthetic capability of the leaf. But if you've got a, a fairly strong tree, it's not as devastating as the fruit rot. I might point out that there is not a, a good correlation between the amount of, of frog eye leaf spot and the amount of black rot in the tree. Now, white rot is, is in a rot that comes in as a post harvest. Actually, after the uh, sugar levels on the apple start to elevate, then we become susceptible to white rot. So it's not one you're going to see early in the year. And I'll, I'm moving over to the right side. We've got fire blight, uh, which is a bacterial disorder that really scares you on apples and, and pear production. Uh, most fire blight comes into the bloom. And, and uh, insects will move it a lot. Rain splash will move it. The uh, symptoms that we often see are the shoots wilting down and turning dark color and the shepherd's crook, you know, where the growing point on the shoot will just uh, wilt over. But actually, in most cases, when you look closely at that shoot, you'll see a cancer at the basal part of that shoot that's actually where the fire blight invaded and it girdled the shoot, causing it to die back. So, fire blight control. Is a year round program. And when we prune, if we see cancers in the tree from fire blight, we want to cut them out and get that wood away from the tree because those cancers are full of the bacteria that cause fire blight. And as the temperatures warm, you can see a uh, little clear droplets of fluid around those cancers that are full of the bacteria. If you see, uh, you may have insects visit that, those uh, uh, cancers and pick up some of the bacteria. and they're spreading it. So one of the controls in commercial orchards we use for fire blight is a pre-bloom spray of copper. Uh, something like uh, well, uh, several different formulations of copper, but foci is the one that we use mostly. And, and basically we're putting it on to sanitize the surface of the tree so that if the insect visits one of those droplets of fluid and picks up some of the bacteria, but then walks on the wind with that copper residue the copper will kill the bacteria. Uh, and, and fortunately, the foci will also work on some of the other diseases that become a problem at the same time, like the apple scale. Um, 
might point out too that another good reason to be vigilant on cutting out fire blight is that um, other diseases like black rot, bitter rot, white rot will colonize fire blight cases. So they they persist very well in association with fire blight. So we need to be really uh, on our toes in the cleaning to get those chances out. Probably mildew is a problem that we'll see uh, in some varieties worse than others. And one of the reasons I don't recommend Jonathan in Tennessee is because of this disease. Cedar apple rust is, is a problem on some varieties, others it's not. Uh, the cedar rust problem is, is one that we address by spraying the trees at the right time because the spores from the cedar, when the gongs in the cedar that are now uh, fairly hard and dark brown, uh, when we get warm rainy periods, then it won't be long before this happens. You'll see gelatinous spore horns being put out of those gongs, and that's when we need to be spraying them out. Spores from cedar rust can travel several miles, but of course, the closer the cedar trees are to the apples, the worse the problem is. You can, uh, you realistically, in most parts of Tennessee, cannot remove cedars to get away from the disease. So you're spraying the tree at the right time. And there are some good materials. Uh, Manzade or Dipane is one of them, but there's several other materials that will do a good job on cedar rust control. Captain is not one of them. It does not work well. Uh, so uh, I might point out that the, uh, the new commercial apple guide spray guide is out. Uh, we'll be sending copies in this month's mailing to the county. Um, it's also going to be online, and I haven't looked the last few days to see if it is online. The peach guide is online, and copies have already gone out. A uh, limited number. We're, uh, we're in, having to cut back almost every year on the hard copies, but uh, it's online. Uh, and, and I just uh, put in well, the name of the publication online and let it do a search and it brings it up pretty pretty easily. Uh, University of Georgia is printing the peach guide. The NC State is printing the apple guide. As far as insects go, one of the things that we, we're seeing more of in, in all of our state parks are scale insects. And, and uh, Santa's A scale might be uh, the primary one we see, but uh, it can cause a lot of problems. In scale insects, they're actually more of a problem on the woody tissue than they are on the fruit. Uh, one of the entomologists I work with in Georgia says that you see scale on the fruit, that means that you already got it pretty bad on the wood because they don't like the fruit as well. And so this slide shows, starting in the upper left hand corner, a stem of last year's growth of scale infected and are infested. And you can see the scale on top of the, the bark, and I've cut away the bark to expose the tissue underneath. That purple streaking you see is the result of scale feeding damage. The middle slide on the left is, is an impact uh, uh, tree that's got scale on it, and uh, it's a white peak scale, a different scale. And then down to the bottom is, is still a different type of scale. The apple that's shown here has same as a scale on and, and the scale insect is hard to control because uh, most of its life is not moving. It, it'll, it'll be uh, settled down and it'll be feeding and it'll have a paraffin like scale or covering over it that will pretty much keep off insecticide. So the best thing we use for scale are, are donut oil. The oil will actually cover the, the uh, scale insect and cut of our breathing pores and smother. And so scale uh, control is, is largely uh, accomplished through the use of dormant or delayed dormant sprays on certain crops. We do have some success using a uh, light rate of some of the, uh, the oils in summer months, but you're, you have to be careful to get, you get the rates too high, you're going to do some damage. Another insect that we see in, in a lot of our fruits, and this shows it on apple, but it's actually on the top two slides, it's in the apple, on the bottom two, it's in peach. Funcotelio uh, 
and damage fruit in that the adult will lay a will make a, a special shaped wound on the fruit and lay its eggs under the skin flap and when the larvae hatches out and starts to feed, uh, it can damage the fruit to the point that it drops off. And you see this a lot in pieces. When people say, well, all the pieces fell off the tree, why is that? It may well be first generation plant material. And that's what you can see on those pieces in the bottom of the slide. And you can actually see the, the larvae in one of those. With the jelly coming out of the fruit, you can see that in uh, the picture of the feet uh, just below the apple. Uh, the second generation of the plant material comes in the midsummer. And those fruits, if they're infested, don't drop off the tree but they do ripen through your maturity in some cases. So if you've got a, a, a fruit that's responsive to ethylene, uh, the damage that the um, plant material can do is stimulate premature ripening in the tree. <coughs> plant is is uh, not hard to control, but it does uh, require kind of a multi-pronged uh, effect. And it does overwinter in the debris on the orchard floor. So the better job we do cleaning the orchard floor and getting that leaf litter and mummified fruit to, to rot down, uh, the easier it is to control from material. And then it, we're looking at timely spray uh, to the tree canopy itself. There is an organic recommendation uh, for jarring fruit to dislodge the cotillo and uh, get them to drop to on the ground under the tree. If somebody's not wanting to spray and has just a tree or two, that may be a feasible way to go about it. But it, uh, it is something we have to take care of because it can cost us a lot of problems. In apples, one of the uh, bigger fruit problems we see with insects is called cotton moth. And you can see cotton moth damage in the apple. Uh, the cotton moth will go through the outside of the fruit but it will tend to tunnel directly to the core of the apple and will feed in the seed cavity on the fruit. And in fact, cutting the apple open and looking at the pattern of travel of this insect is one of the ways that we can identify it as opposed to say oriental fruit moss. And we'll have several generations of cotton moss uh, over the season. We can monitor the development of cotton moss and predict when we're going to see problems. Uh, it, we do have some growers that have tried that and been successful on it. It does take a little bit more close monitoring of the oil. Okay, so we covered several of the um, the major problems on Apple. We move on to other crops. And Darby, you've got to keep me in line on time. Uh, just a little bit about fair, real quickly. We're growing, we can grow two types of pears in Tennessee, the European pear and the Asian pear. Now, the European pear is more, usually more shaped, like we normally think of as a pear shape, whereas the Asian pear quite often is referred to as a pear apple or an apple pear because they're rounded like an apple. Uh, the European pear tends to be characterized by a, a softer, juicy flesh. Whereas Asian pears quite often are more crisp and juicy uh, all the way up until ripening. One of the unique things about a European pear is that uh, they get their best quality if we do not let them ripen on the tree. You know, most tree fruits, the best quality is from a tree ripening fruit. But with European pears, if we pick them when they're mature, but not ripe, put them in the refrigeration for a couple of weeks bring them back out and ripe on that room temperature, they'll have fewer grit cells, they'll be uh, a lot better eating quality than if we allow them to tree ripen. Asian pears, on the other hand, do best when they're allowed to ripen fully on the tree. Um, fire blight is the biggest concern on all pears, especially the Asian variety, or the European variety, I'm sorry. Um, and, and so as we look at variety selection, uh, fire blight resistance is going to be one of the primary criteria. Unfortunately, the pairs that most people hear about or are familiar with from the storage, bark 
Bartlett and Joe Bach are some of the more fireweight susceptible varieties. And so we look at things like Ayers, uh, Warren is, is a fair out of Mississippi, Mungo, uh, uh, those varieties are pretty good quality pairs, but they have fire blight resistance. We stand a better chance of keeping the trees alive and productive than we do with some, something like Bartlett. Asian pears are susceptible to fire blight. However, they don't necessarily appear to be quite as susceptible as the European variety. Move into stone fruit. Uh, <coughs> most of the pieces grown in Tennessee and the southeast are, are white, but are yellow white pieces, not white. Um, people think of pieces classically as being yellow flesh. Uh, we have free stone and clean stone pieces. Uh, our market is pretty much settled on yellow flesh free stone pieces. And the free stone means that when that piece is ripe, when you cut it open and split it open, the pit will separate readily from the flesh of the fruit. Uh, and that's a nice characteristic for uh, eating as well as for processing some of the pieces. But um, when I started in Tennessee, pieces were a lot more risky crops than they are right now, primarily because we were having uh, cold enough winters and, and enough spring frost uh, that we were not cropping very regularly. And also, we didn't have varieties with long chilling requirements like we do now. So, with the advent of new varieties, things like uh, Contender, uh, Carolina Gold, and Trepid, that have thousand plus hour chilling requirements, uh, we've got some good yellow flesh free stone pieces that will make it in places that we didn't use to recommend pieces. Uh, we've got a grower, for example, up on the Sipel in Bradford County that is growing species contender is the primary variety that uh that they've got and it, it's been fairly consistent white flesh peaches are gaining in popularity uh, a lot of people refer them to them as a low acid peach and uh they think that a white flesh peach root tastes sweeter than the yellow if it does it's because the lower acid content uh, makes it taste that way but there are a couple of varieties of, of white flesh species worthy of consideration to Tennessee, primarily because of the long chilling requirement. Nectar, which will come in in uh, mid to late July, and China Pearl, which will come in the end of August, are the two that, that are the best suited white flesh species for Tennessee. Both of them are free stone, uh, and uh, they do have a, a fairly uh, good following in the area where people know of them. Now, I might go back and revisit the terminology, the chilling requirement, just a bit because we talked about it with a lot of our fruit crops. Chilling requirement as refers to a dormant uh, plant. And, and basically, it, it's talking about the number of hours of cold temperatures, generally between 32 degrees and 45 degrees Fahrenheit, necessary to satisfy an internal requirement in that plant to allow it. To break down the same grow normally once weather conditions stay to grow. We, we talk about two types of dormancy in fruit crop. One of them is endodormancy, and that's controlled by internal factors within the tree, within the vine, within the bush that prevents growth even though weather conditions might favor it. And when we satisfy our chilling requirement, now we can see that endodormancy. We are now looking at eco dormancy, and this is weather dictated. You know, when it, if it's still cold, the, the plant's not growing, it's not uh, it's not developing because weather conditions just are not favorable for growth. But when we get warmer weather conditions, we'll see activity start very quickly in these plants. See it in bud swell, changes in the color of the fruiting wood on peach, uh, and then we'll progress, of course, into of bloom and new tissue. So chilling requirement is something I look at a lot in, in fruit crops. In peaches, if I could find varieties with over a thousand hours chilling, that's what I really put my first choices on in the varieties I mentioned to you are those. Uh, and the apple, on the other hand, chilling requirement is not that big a deal. We, we're much more consistent. Uh, apples are more tolerant of cold in the winter. They bloom later. 
Uh, and therefore, they're not as prone to that late frost as, as our stone to uh, Talk earlier about tree stone versus tree stone feet. Uh, if you go into some of the areas uh, where processing pieces are grown, they're growing a lot of clean stone peat. The fresh market is just not that good because it's too hard to, to separate the pit from the flesh. So most of our market is focused on tree stone varieties. Uh, this is an unusual piece that it's called a donut piece that Tian Hill comes out of China and it's uh, and you can see it's shaped like a donut. And you can actually punch the seed out and have something that with a hole in the middle that looks just like a donut. It's grown some in Tennessee. It's kind of a, a premium price because it's not as productive. It's a little bit more difficult to grow. But uh, you might run into this in some cases, especially if you've got somebody that likes this. It's a little unusual. Uh, I'm quite often now I'll hear people talk about wanting to dwarf peach trees. Uh, one of the things I try to point out is that the peach trees that we use for fruit production are not dwarf. Uh, they, the, uh, they tend to be relatively small trees and we can train them to keep them relatively small, but it's not a rootstock effect. The rootstock that we use on our uh, flirting peaches will give us what we consider to be a full size tree. Things like Calford or Guardian. Uh, there is a new one out at um, actually a peach plum hybrid rootstock developed by USDA that uh, will give us some size reduction in peach. So we're, we're, I think on over the next few years, we are going to see some size control rootstock for pretty peach. You will see dwarf peaches advertised. Most of the time, these are also referred to as a patio peach. Have beautiful blooms, prolific blooms, but the fruit is inferior on them. And so uh, the ornamental peaches are not going to be a good selection for fruit or vice versa. Peaches come into bearing fairly early. I think, I think that in a, a normal situation, the third year the trees are in the ground, we should be able to let them start the fruit. Look at full production in five to six years. Peach trees don't live as long as apples in the most conditions, but still in Tennessee, uh, we do pretty good. 15, 17, 18 years is not at all uncommon in the peach orchard. And we're talking about the entire orchard. It may well be that by the end of that period, we've got enough gap in the orchard to make it economically questionable, but individual trees may be uh, fruitful for well into the 20 or 30 year uh, age group. If you contrast that to areas further south, average peach tree life in Georgia is somewhere around 10 to 12 years. Uh, how much fruit do we get off a tree? On peach, it's generally about three bushels per tree is what I, I consider to be a good crop. The varieties that we grow um, generally will be picking peaches from early June on up into September, but the best part of the peaches are coming in after the 4th of July. And so mid July to early August is where we really get the best quality fruit. Peaches are, are uh, a little bit different in storage than apple. Uh, now, if you're growing peaches and you, and you have a local market where you can allow the peaches to get close to uh, fully ripe on the tree, nobody's going to come close to offering as good a piece of what you've got. But uh, realize that they're also very fragile and that's. Uh, the reason that we don't get really high quality peaches in from the west coast is because they couldn't stand the fit. So local growers have a leg up on getting that tree wrap and fit for their customers. Storage wise, a lot of times if we store peaches in cold storage at all, we do it at relatively high temperatures, like about 60 degrees. It'll slow down the, uh, the peach and, and make it last longer. However, if you put peaches in at cold temperatures, like below 40 degrees, that fruit can actually develop a bitter taste. So uh, our storage on peach tends to be very short term, uh, just as a way to prolong from one day to the next in most cases. <coughs> Excuse me. Talked a lot about um, varieties. Let's just mention a few of the 
disease problems and insect problems. Brown rot is the number one disease with stone fruit. Uh, we have brown rot hit the, the blossoms of the fruit. And then the next stage that is real bad is when you're getting ready to harvest. Brown rot moves quickly in the fruit. So you might find a peach that has a small brown rot spot in it in the morning. By afternoon, half of that peach may have gone downhill. And by the next day, the rest of the peach is consumed by the rot. And species adjacent to it may have already started to go down. So brown rot is, is a real threat to us. Uh, we, we address it through our spray program, uh, through our sanitation program, because the mummified fruit from brown rot will stay on the tree or on the ground and provide an option for that disease. Uh, we also, uh, we're going to be, uh, if possible, uh, pulling peaches off the trees as soon as we see brown rot coming in so that we can slow it down. Uh, there are other diseases. Uh, peach scab is, is one that we see that uh, it's kind of an interesting disease because uh, it takes a while for scab to develop. You, in an early ripening peach, you won't necessarily ever have scab, or at least you'll never see it because it, it ripens before the disease can develop. We've also got another disease called bacterial spot. And uh, it can be devastating to the trees. It hits the leaves and the fruit. And it's, of course, like many other diseases, it's going to be related to weather conditions, especially early in the year. Uh, the varieties of peaches that are developed in the east, many of them are uh, have some resistance to bacterial spot. And so we generally recommend growers buying varieties that were developed in the east. There are some uh, varieties out of California, like Old Henry, that are really good peaches, but they also are very bad about susceptibility to bacterial spot. And primarily because up until just a few years ago, that disease did not exist in the West Coast. And so there was no sense of breed for it. Uh, other insect, insect issues we have, we've already seen pumps material. Oriental fruit moss is the one that we have. Uh, the first generation hits the growing point on the tree. Successive generations will get into the fruit. And we can have multiple generations of oriental fruit moss per growing season in Tennessee. Peach tree bore hits the, the lower part of the trunk. When we treat the trunk of the tree uh, for bore control, the bore will enter the trunk, grow through the uh, bark, and we'll spend the rest of the growing season in the following winter in the inside the trunk and uh, do some damage to the tree. Of course, the smaller the trunk, the fewer bores it takes to damage it. And so we'll come through uh, when we spray insecticides. We, we want to get trunk covered through the sprays that will help. But then after harvest, we come in with a directed spray to the trunk of the tree for bore control. Right now, lower van is the key material to be used. However, that may change because the future of lower van is quite impressive. Lesser peach tree bore uh, is different from the regular peach tree bore in that it hits further up in the tree. Uh, and uh, it actually appears to be attracted to the tree by wounds in the tree. So uh, our, our regular insect spray program for the fruit will help control with the bore. As I mentioned earlier, the, the new pest control guide, the, uh, the Southeastern Peach, Nectarine, and Plum Pest Management and Culture Guide is out now. It's online and, uh, and accessible. This slide shows brown rot, scab, and bacterial spot. And brown rot is the upper left hand side. It's a soft rot and it spreads very fast and it will move from fruit to fruit. Uh, quickly uh, as we approach ripening. Scab, uh, usually scab is a surface disorder. That is, if you feel the peach, you won't necessarily know that it's there. And people are used to seeing this in a lot of cases, and some people actually think it's a normal part of the peach, and they call it freckling on the peach, and, and uh, they don't want to buy a peach that doesn't have freckles. So. Uh, but severe scab can actually deform the fruit, so we, we try to control that. Bacterial spot, uh, shown in the lower part of this slide, uh, you can see the damage on the fruit, and sometimes the damage will get 
the point that the, the fruit will actually do the third gummy material at the point of damage and of course the fruit is no good. Uh, as far as the leaves, you'll start to see spotting on the leaves uh, and then the leaves will turn yellow and drop off the tree and we'll have pretty significant defoliation in mid summer. What do we do about bacteria spot? Well, first off, it's, it's a uh, variety selection for uh, resistance, and, and there is no 100% uh, resistance for you. And then we're going to spray early on uh, to lessen uh, early infection. And if we have uh, continued infection pressure on up in the growing season, we are using uh, some materials. Uh, Coside, again, a low rate of copper is often used. And there is a bacteria side that's labeled uh, for use of bacterial spot, although it's fairly expensive and most of growers rely on coppers. So the insects that we look at, Funkatilla, like we talked about, Oriental fruit moth, peach tree borer, lesser borer, June beetle can be a fungus. And uh, most of the time, June beetle uh, is more of an issue on leaves than it is on the fruit, but it will be on a uh, fruit, especially if that fruit starts to. Uh, it gets overripe and starts to go down here. So here you can see in the upper left hand corner a peach tree that has gotten oriental fruit moth damage. First generation where the adult lays its eggs on that growing tip and the larvae feed on that growing tip and, and kill it. And what will happen after a little while is you'll get a side bud a little bit down the shoot to break and grow in and uh, continue to give you more leaf area. The problem with oriental fruit moth at this stage is that if you're trying to develop young trees and you're trying to promote balance in the scaffold, then oriental fruit moth can destroy that. Uh, the rest, the other two slides show oriental fruit moth in the fruit. And you can see the flash and the jelly coming out on the lowest picture because of oriental fruit moth. And then you can see oriental fruit moth at the top, and that's actually in a map. Uh, but you can see the damage uh, with that. Uh, and so these insects need to be controlled. And I uh, mentioned earlier, we have multiple generations of oriental fruit moth for growing trees. Beyond that, I'm, I think we we'll move on. Uh, nectarine, pretty much what we said about peaches, holds with nectarine. You don't have much interest in nectarines. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but in, in um, several places I talked to growers and they said that when they grow nectarines, they just were not a big seller. And so they're, they're not looking at them. And they're not, and really that's not a bad thing because nectarines are a little bit more difficult to control around than peach. That smooth skin makes it harder to get a fungicide to adhere. And uh, we also had problems with fruit splitting uh, on nectarines. Just if we get a rainy period as we approach ripening, we see a lot of splitting and loss of fruit. So not a lot on nectarines, but the same insect and disease patterns as we see on peas. And the same is true for plums. Uh, we grow both European and Japanese plums. Uh, plums tend to bloom a little early in peas, therefore frost is an issue. But the same type of, of diseases, there is one other, I think I got, yeah, this is it. This is black knot that you'll see on peach, or, I'm sorry, you see on plums, and you see on cherry. It's a fungal disorder, and uh, it can do serious damage to the tree. Pretty much all varieties of, of uh, plum and uh, cherry are susceptible that I'm aware of. Uh, and the best control for black knot is when you see it, prune it out and turn it out as soon as you can and come several inches below the basal part of that to make the pruning cut during the growing season. Uh, the worst black knot I've ever seen was in the tart cherry oak in New York State. But we'll see a lot of this every year. Uh, inevitably, it's going to get down the trunk of the tree or on the main scaffold end and the tree is going to go down as a result. But by pruning it out, uh, and there are some fungicides that can help or help, we can extend the productive life of those trees. 
I don't talk much about cherries in Tennessee primarily because it's not a good crop in Tennessee. Tart cherry is better than sweet. And if you grow tart cherries, the dominant tart cherry variety across the nation is one called Mont Uh It's a pie cherry uh, and, and it'll, it'll stand out of weather quite well. It's fairly significant as far as its productive capability, the self-fertile bloom. Uh, the biggest problem that we have with tart cherries is birds. They tend to know uh, just ahead of some years and tend to harvest the crop. They, they know that and they're going to go in and feed. Uh, so netting is almost uh, an essential issue if you want to keep birds off. Um, there's a, a, another variety called early Richmond pictured in the lower part of this page, uh, this slide. And it too is a tart cherry and uh, it will fruit. The fruit is not as big as Mount Marantz, and So a good bit of that cherry itself is, is made up of the pit and not as much meat as you see with the Mount Marantz. Sweet cherries just don't do well in Tennessee. Most of the time the seeds tend to be relatively sensitive to cold and there are cancer diseases that move in, especially where cold injury has occurred. And if you have cancer diseases, it seems to even further predispose the seeds to cold injury. So uh, we've had some growers uh, trying to grow sweet cherries. In most cases, the crop frequency has been very low. We lose a lot of trees. And, and many of the growers that have tried them have gotten rid of them simply because they're, they're not fruiting frequently enough to be economically feasible to maintain. Things we don't recommend in Tennessee, uh, you get a lot of people wanting to grow apricots. Uh, and uh, I might point out that pluots, plumcots, apriums, and apriplums are apricot plums. Crosses. And they're subject to the same uh, weaknesses that you find with apricots. Primarily, they have very low chilling requirements. Uh, about 500 hours is the chilling requirement of, of the apricot varieties I'm aware of. That means that by Christmas time, that tree has had all the sold it needs. And if you get a warm spell, they're starting to de harden. And of course, you offer the fit bud. Uh, because they're, they're no longer tolerant of their cold weather. It's going to be a real issue. And cropping frequency is very, very poor on, on these trees. So uh, we can run into the tree nuts just a bit and talk about that. And uh, the, if you've got any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them now or later on. Primary, I, I listed some nurseries on nut trees in, in a um, and I'll also put a picture right over it, I think. But that first nursery is called Nolan River Nut Tree Nursery. Uh, and and uh, it's in Kentucky. Uh, and they specialize in grafted nut trees. Uh, and they have some nice trees, but like a lot of the nurseries that, that propagate nut trees, they tend to get sold out real early. And, and in many cases, you have to advance order your trees if you want to get it. Others that I've listed, Walmart Nursery out of Texas. I've seen some nice trees coming from them. Uh, Texas Pecan Nursery will have a fairly good variety. Some of their pecan varieties will do well in Tennessee, some won't. So we need to pay attention. But there is a place in Tennessee that's propagating nut trees. Uh, they're a uh, very expensive tree. So um, we'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about some of these. And pecans, we got. Uh, fairly wide array of, of varieties out there. Pecan actually is, is, uh, will fruit much further north than where we are. And there are some northern varieties and some of them listed here that are growing in Tennessee and doing fairly well. Uh, you notice that, well, all of these have a uh, shorter uh, ripening period. When we talk about pecans, one of the things that's a little deceiving is that we'll talk about the uh, adequate ripening period between blooming and not maturity. And if you get a variety like Stewart, that's uh, say 180 plus up to about 200 days, and um, 
for many years, the Stuart won't pull the Stuart in Tennessee because we don't have a long enough cross three period. Well, it's important to realize that a pecan is going to be about the last thing that we have to bloom, and it'll bloom in June. And so when we talk about not the 30, we're talking about from the time of bloom until frost, and, and not just from the frost free period in the spring to the fall of the year. So we're looking at, at varieties that have a shorter uh, maturity period. Um, out of these, uh, the, the northern varieties as a whole are not a thin shell for county. Uh, they're not real big. Green River can get to be decent size, but they can be very high quality. And major pecan uh, is a very high quality nut, but it's not a very big nut. Uh, and we can grow them in our area uh, as well as further north. One of the things you see if you start looking at pecan nursery catalogs uh, is uh, re reference to either Protandrous versus type, protogenous variety, or type one versus type two variety. And basically, what we're talking about with protandrous or type one pecans, those are pecans where the pollen is shed before the female flower is recessive. Now, pecan has both male and female flower parts on the same tree, but they're not in the same structure. In pecan, the, the catching or the, the pollen, uh, formed in the summer before uh, the, the crop actually develops. The female flower forms on the end of the current season shoot. And so they're physically separated on the tree, but pecan, like most nut trees, are what we consider to be self sterile That is, cross pollination is essential if you want to have much of the crop at all. And so we want to know. Uh, the nature of the blooms on the tree and mash up a substantial variety. That's a one that says it's probably early with one where the female flower is receptive fairly early and, and vice versa on protogeny. And that's why you'll see this listed in a lot of our sources on protogeny. So these are northern varieties. These are some other varieties. Many of them are new, uh, relatively new, and uh, have not been widely explored in Tennessee. Uh, we do have a, a, there is an area agent in Athens, Alabama area that really looks at pecans a lot and he's become a real good source of information to me on varieties that, that we ought to look at in, in uh, Tennessee. Now in the eastern part of the United States, one of the first things we look at in, in a pecan variety is whether or not it has any resistance to pecan scab. Uh, that's a serious disease, primarily because the, the trees are big. Uh, most of the, the homeowners can't spray for it because they don't have the equipment. Uh, it also is a disease that can happen as, throughout the entire growing season. So it's not like apple scab that happens early and that's it for the rest of the year. Uh, we'll have pecan scab development throughout the summer months. So resistant varieties have been almost a uh, requirement for planting a pecan in the east. But some of these new varieties are really good. In the uh, well, Kansas, for example, the third one down on this list, it's an early maturing nut. But one of the interesting things about it is that uh, contrary to a lot of pecan varieties, that have a tendency to annual bear. That is a big crop one year, almost no crop the next year. Kansas seems to have the ability to fruit fairly well every year. It's also a precocious tree, which means that it'll start production early in its life. Now, when we talk about nut trees in general, uh, if you're growing the nut tree for the nuts and not growing for wood, you want to have grafted trees. And the reason for that is. Uh, first off, when you vegetatively propagate a pecan, uh, you know what the pecan is going to be like when it starts to fruit. If you grow from seed, you don't have any idea uh, because it's seed, they're, they're, uh, they cross pollinate, and you'll see a lot of variables when you grow a pecan up from seed. Another advantage of a grafted pecan tree is it'll cut back the time it takes to 
beginning of the production by many years. And so uh, Jackson trees, the reliable varieties and earlier bearing, but Santa seems to be even earlier bearing than a lot of the other varieties. And then uh, there are more pecans coming along, uh, red line. So this picture will be changing with time. Um, look a little bit. Uh, this chart is taken from Texas Congress. And, and basically, what it shows is the time of, of uh, pollen discharge uh, in relation to the time of female receptivity. And, and you can see a, a big difference here among some varieties. Most of the time, pollen is not shed at a time that the female is receptive to pollination. And therefore, cross-pollination is essential. Uh, how often, how close does a pecan tree need to be to a pollen source? I don't know. The closer, the better. Pecans are wind pollinated. I'd like to have trees within probably 150 feet or so, if possible. Uh, but, you know, here in, in a lot of parts of Tennessee where you don't have a lot of pecans, the closer they are, the better. Because if at the time of catkins or pollen discharge from the catkins, if you get a rainy period, then that pollen is not going to be dispersed over a very wide area. So the closer the pollen source is to the tree needing pollination, the better off you are. If you go places like South Georgia, Southern Alabama and Mississippi, where there are so many pecans, that's not a big issue because the air is full of pollen uh, most of the spring. One thing, uh, another crop that you, you don't see much of, but it's out there, and every now and then we run across it, is the hickon, which is cross between pecans and hickory. Um, I don't get too excited about them because the crosses I've seen, basically, they've taken the bad points of each one and turn it into one crop. Uh, they tend to be fairly thick shells, hard to crack, and, and not necessarily a high quality kernel. But they're out there, and you may well get some uh, some inquiries about them or see some of those. And this is a, a thick on pretty size nut, but again, a lot of them are fairly thick shells. Uh, we do have some interest in hazelnut or filbert. Uh, there, uh, actually, hazelnut is native to East of North America. Uh, the two main limiting factors on hazelnut production is a disease called Eastern Silver Blight. But we do have some resistant varieties, and there are more coming down the road. And then the lack of adequate cold hardiness. Uh, what we'll see, we'll see two types of cold hardiness in, in that, uh, in the tree. And the first one, is damage to woody tissues to the trunk of the tree, uh, to the scaffold, maybe uh, limbs on the tree. The other type is damage to the catkin or the pollen. In, uh, in a mild winter, we'll get pollen discharge quite early, and therefore, that uh, a given variety is going to be an unreliable pollinator in some instances. Uh, Overall, we're seeing more varieties come down the road with resistance to eastern silver white. And part of the reason for that is that um, the West Coast, which is where most of the silvers are grown, now has eastern silver white. It's an issue out there. And so we're starting to see uh, some, some breeding out there, as well as some more from the east to get resistant varieties. I'm growing hazelnut out of the plant size farm, but growing it primarily as a support crop for um, coffee. Now, whether we're going to be successful or not, I don't know. But we do have uh, good growth and good fruiting. Uh, and if we've got the right varieties, we'll get some uh, production fairly early. Now, hazelnut, contrary to other nut trees, is not necessarily a grafted tree. You can layer the tree. Uh, later, shoot off the tree and root it and, and uh, use that to the new tree, or you can graft it. Hazelnuts are grown as bushes, like you see in the top of this slide, or as a single trunk tree, like you see down below. Uh, they, uh, they, are, um, they can get fairly good size. Uh, so a bush can be 8 to 12 feet or so in height, a tree 14, 16 feet, and about the same width. Hazelnuts of fruit somewhere around the fourth year, 
and you will see folks of Exodus two or three years after that. Like Satan that cross pollinated. Um, and, and so we need to make sure that we've got our pollen source relatively close to the variety needing pollination. Uh, Hazelnuts, like the pounds, like most of our, our tree nuts, lack of soil with pH around 6.5. We did walnuts, you'll see 6, 5, or 6 up to 7.5 is the range. But, you know, if you go 6, 5, you're going to be right in, in where at the sweet spot. Uh, hazelnuts can be fairly long lives, you hear them for 30 to 40 years, uh, and can get some good yield. There's actually, um, there's a fairly strong demand for hazelnuts. Uh, it's just the supply is not here, and most of them are coming in from outside the country. But uh, there's a Ferro Reserve, uh, it's a candy company, and they're in, I think they're located in Canada, and they're one of the largest pieces of hazelnuts in, in the world, and they have trouble getting private over it. Chestnuts, uh, we don't hear a lot about them. Uh, of course, the American chestnut went by the wayside with chestnut blight. Uh, there is a breakthrough on that. I saw this past summer uh, information out of Cornell that they identified the gene responsible for that, and they have been able to insert the gene that would uh, hopefully control it for a period of time. But what we're seeing a lot more if you're growing chestnut is growing. Uh, something other than the American chestnut because the trees don't live well and the American chestnut tends to have relatively small nuts. In fact, the Chinese chestnut is the most common one grown uh, for nut production because the tree is quite blight resistant. It's not immune. Uh, you'll see limbs that will take the blight and, and go down as a result, but it won't take the whole tree out like it will in American chestnut. Uh, the, uh, Trees are also relatively low in spreading, and um, the nuts tend to be fairly good size, sweet, and fairly easy to peel. The primary insect problem on chestnut is similar to what we see in pecan. That is the weevil, the worm that's in the nut. And a lot of times, if you see a hole in the pecan and you see a hole in the chestnut, it's an exit hole where that weevil larvae has bored through the shell and come out. The adult will lay its eggs on that uh, not earlier in the season, and the larvae will need, will feed inside the nut until it comes out. And quite often, when that nut falls from the tree and hits the ground, then the weevil is going to come out and go back into the fall to complete its life cycle. Uh, so, if you've got nut stops, be prepared to address the weevil control issue. Uh, a grafted Chinese chestnut tree will come into bearing lots of the early. So you can look at early nut production of three, four years of age uh, for some varieties. Uh, again, we talked about a 6.5 pH, well drained soil. As far as where chestnuts grow fairly well, uh, we look at uh, well, they'll do well in our area, and, and a lot of times uh, where peaches grow, uh, we also seem to see a favorable environment for chestnut, Chinese chestnut production. Uh, this is uh, addresses pollination similar to other fruit crops. Uh, male and female flowers on the same plant, but cross pollination is essential to get stuff, to get good stuff. As far as walnuts, uh, People are interested in growing English walnuts for nut production. I've not really seen that work out well in Tennessee. The trees I've seen all have had some winter injury. Uh, they, they're just not good performers for us. The black walnut, people find, uh, want to grow black walnut with the idea that they can put out a walnut plane and harvest the nuts and sell the nuts. And, then, and later on, their grandkids can harvest the timber. Well, in all honesty, that doesn't work too well. Uh, black walnut has high value wood. It's used for the veneers, used for the lumber. It also has a fairly valuable nut. But nut production and wood production on the same tree is not apt to happen. 
It's part of that is because of your, your philosophy and how we grow the tree. If you're going to grow a black one like the timber, you want to plant the trees that sort are of close together. Primarily, you do, want, you do not want a lot of sunlight getting into the floor of the plant. You want a trunk that goes straight and tall without a lot of side bends. And if you have a lot of space and a lot of sunlight sensors, that's not going to happen. Uh, and it may well, it takes a long time for a, a black walnut tree to get up to where it may be good for timber or veneer. And, but if you go for the fruit, it's a quicker return, but we use a wider spacing uh, of the trees so that we can get sunlight penetration to all parts of the trees. We want a shorter tree and a, a with a tiny stuff that we get that and more spreading things so that we've got better crop and potential. That's about it. And uh, I'd be glad to try to entertain any questions or cover areas I might have missed. Hopefully, this is something that is you know, some benefit to you. So let me put stop here. And, and if there are any questions that you know, I'll try to answer. Hey Doug, Philip Shelby. Hey, how late is too late to prune blueberries? Uh, you still got time. In fact, but I would prune them as soon as I could. Uh, and it, it depends a little bit so it's on the age of the plant. Uh, you know, if it's a young plant where you really don't want it to fruit yet, you want it to grow more, uh, the sooner you can prune it, the better off you are. You don't want to wait. Some of that stored energy within the plant on trying to develop any fruit. So you can it as soon as you can. As far as the older bush, uh, I would still go ahead and prune. And, uh, you know, part of what you're doing is, is opening up the canopy for sunlight penetration to develop or to maintain fruit wood low in the canopy. And you don't want to wait too late to see that. But now's not a bad time to do it. You can get pretty good. Uh, Results from pruning. It would be better if you were pruning out some of the larger things to try to force new things to come in and take their place. It would have been better to do that before we saw any activity in the bush, before it actually broke and dormant. But, you know, if you haven't been done yet, go ahead and do it now. Anything else? Greg, did you have anything? No, sounded good to me. I, I was actually just filling out the fruit deal there and uh, would like to hear maybe in the future talk more about the caneberry stuff, you know, the new novel caneberries and things like that. But for, I thought you did an exceptional job in terms of covering a lot of those pests and stuff with the uh, uh, apple and peach trees and such. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And we can put together that. I might point out to uh, uh, Natalie Bumgarner, uh, Jack Lewis, and myself, uh, we're putting in a new training of blackberries at the Middle Tennessee Experiment Station this, this spring. Uh, we're looking at 10 varieties. Uh, some of them are climatine bears, some of them are chloroquine bears. The two new varieties, cattle and Tonka, uh, are included in this. And we're also looking at, at different skeleton designs. So that's going to be, uh, hopefully, we're going to have the plants in and the growing, and we'll have at least some of the skeletons up by the time they have the fruit of the backyard, which is set for June 15th. And also, hopefully, COVID is going to be uh, a non issue where we can do a face to face uh, program. So that may be something, uh, you know, worth seeing or. Uh, telling people about uh, coming down the road on the same very issue. In the event that COVID is still a problem and we cannot have a live um, event, we're hoping to do some, some videoing just prior to the actual field day date so that we can do a, a, a video conference that Natalie and I will uh, narrate live as we show the videos of the different varieties and color consistent. We're also going to see some of the work on blueberries, like our ground cover uh, trials this, this winter in that, uh, that field. I know
know uh, here on the plateau, uh, I've got some of the Primark 45s and those Primacanes absolutely were trying to bear fruit in the winter time here on the yeah. Back, but that stuff continued to set fruit. If I, I think if I'd offered any type of protection to them whatsoever, they'd have probably have bared fruit on in through the winter. So a little bit of management and pruning and kind of, you know, uh, the just the general management of those primacanes and cutting them back and, you know, how much protection could we use in a home garden uh, to kind of sustain those. But it, I took pictures here on the plateau in early December of uh, those things setting fruit and they'd get stung back and then it'd kind of green up and start over again and they'd get stung back. But I think if I'd offered any type of cold frame or some type of protection, they'd probably buried into mid or late December. Yeah, I, I think you're right, you know, and, and for commercial or, or for the amateur or hobby grower, uh, you know, high quality for, for something like blackberry or raspberry uh, could be uh, a, a pretty good thing and really extend the season a long way. Hey, I got a question on, on raspberries. If if I had a partial shade area, how much sunlight? Uh, I, or, or what what kind of day length sunlight exposure is best? I guess the, the question that comes to mind on the other end is uh, when you say partial shade, is there a portion of the day? When it gets full sun, or is it uh, the heat light most of almost all day? No, it would get full sun part of the day. Uh, I think morning sun is better than mid to late afternoon sun. Okay. So that would make a difference. But a uh, raspberry is a uh, crop that will grow with uh, less than full sun. You know, we do a lot of times we define full sun. Is six to eight hours of full sunlight per day. But a raspberry can often be a, a kind of a border crop and uh, do okay with a partial shade, although it will do better in many cases with, with full sun. As long as, yeah, I, as long as you don't get so hot that some salt is still becomes an issue in the middle of the day. If I had an area that was partial shade, from, you know, throughout the day, is that a better environment? Um, no, not necessarily. I would, I would rather not. I'd rather have some full sun at least a portion of the day. Okay. And continue to the day. Just looking at, at the poles and Looks like there's some opportunity to do some stuff on, on pest control for different crops. Uh, pruning is always an area. Uh, well, it looks like they're because they're kind of keeping out of school hall for a while. I appreciate your thoughts on the areas to uh, to develop information. It, it helps a lot to get the feedback on this. Thank, so thank you very much for that. Appreciate your time today, Dr. Lockwood. As, As always, always thank, you. thank you, David. And also thank you, Darby. Always learn something new. I'm taking notes too. Not taking names, I'm taking notes. <laughs> well, we have recorded this. And so we should um, have it for you all. Uh, hopefully by the end of today, I'll be sending this out. Um, to the agents, the agents and then you can can send out to your, to produ your producers, your producers that, that might be might interested, be interested in, it. in it. Thank you very much.
Thank you for putting this together. You're welcome. Uh, Carla was on earlier, but she's not on now. She had to take her mom to the doctor. Mm -hmm. So I told her we would try to get with you on the pear trees and, and grafting and all of that. Yeah, that's, I, I, I look forward to working with you on that. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lockwood. So you take care. Have a nice weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.